All righty, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Subscribing to My Podcast. Because I have a new guest on the show every week, it's very difficult to get consistent viewership. So if there's one thing that you can do to support me and the guest featured on my show is by interacting with the video. You can always unsubscribe later if you hate me or the content. Without further ado, here's your episode with Robert Bengal, the president of the Guild of Board Gamers and Role Players. This is the famed episode two. Lots of requests to get him back. I actually feel so bad because on the first episode, we had a wonderful conversation and it got ruined by a corrupt audio that um, I just didn't catch while we were recording it. So this is the redemption arc. This is the, we're back. So um, Robert, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the viewers and maybe say some of the things that you feel is important for them to know about you. Yeah, sure thing. I'll, I'll just make it simple. Hi, I'm Robert. And usually I, I prefer Rob, you know, because I'm in a friendly environment at the Guild of Board Gamers and Role Players. We meet in Carver Hall on Saturdays at noon in 205 and Carver 305 on Mondays at 6. It's a lot. You can just play it back if it's, if it's too much. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we bring board games and have an absolute blast. And I love that about the club. I'm the president of the club. I should have led with that, but <laughs> hey, there it is. You know, how, is, how has the club been since we last talked about it? I know that um, you were working on some campaigns and you had already done a few. And so I guess like walk me through, like give me the updates. What are some of the spark notes about what's been going on? Oh, yeah. Of, yeah. So semesters? pretty much for a whole year as a dungeon master for d and I'm what they call forever DM. I'm usually the dungeon master. For about at least a year, maybe even like 18 months or so, I had been making a mega dungeon. The idea of a dungeon usually is that there's the big bad inside, you go and kill him and steal his treasure. And, like, and then you do that and you never return. Mm -hmm. But the mega dungeon is this concept where you repeatedly go down there and it's so big and so dangerous. You make your own goals like, okay, I heard about this magic item over here. I really want that. Or, oh my goodness, this dragon is on my nerves. We need to kill him, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, I built. Okay. I originally intended it for 20 floors, 20 floors, which are each in themselves a dungeon. But I think at the end right now, it's at more like 16. But we, we played a campaign through that and man, it, it came, it was it was a huge learning experience for me, both in making the game and then also with my players just like figuring out what they would do is amazing. I guess what's the what's like inherent difference between playing 16 different dungeons versus like one big one? Is it kind of that like your characters keep are the same and then they keep leveling up in the way that they normally would, um, but you're doing multiple quests or like what's the like remarkable difference between doing one giant game versus uh, 16 different games? 16 different games. That's a good question. I would say the main one is that I intentionally told the players up front, unlike in some campaigns where it might be that, hey, guys, I have this prepared, and so I would appreciate it if you just go along this pathway, right? There's nothing wrong with that because DMs are people too. They have time restrictions. But I set out with, hey, guys, I have. there are so many different avenues you can go. There is no correct way to go, and so that puts the ball in the player's court to figure out what they would like to do. And what they came up with was amazing. They wanted to save one character's grandma from a ghost. They wanted to, they wanted to kill several people because they were, they were, they were on the war path, man. Holy cow. <laughs> and so that didn't make it so that if they ran into an obstacle, it was like, Oh, well, we got to mull around for about 30 minutes to figure out. No, they could, they could say, you know what? I would just rather not tackle that and go somewhere else that I know is fun. And, and where are you guys in the campaign right now? We ended. We ended. Yes. How, how did it go? Was it as beautiful as you had dreamed it had been? It was honestly not as beautiful as I dreamed it would have been. It was a really sad ending because, well, admission, I did make a mistake as a DM. It was very difficult and not in a fun way. There's difficult in the way that the odds are stacked against you, but you can overcome it. Uh, I'm not doing it. That's not exactly the best way to lead here. There's making things difficult as in the number of obstacles you have to overcome is a lot. And then there's difficult as in your chance of success at any given obstacle is low. It is not fun to go through a dungeon where you have a 25% chance at any given success because then you fail and fail and fail and fail. So unfortunately, that was not terribly fun. But 
the players got to uh got to how to put it they got to affect the outcome of the story it was a little it was bittersweet it was it was they stopped the bad guy but they couldn't save that grandma i mentioned unfortunately gosh it, it seems so complex to plan around such like a like a i mean you basically just created a game like you, you just created like an entire skyrim like ecosystem of npcs interacting with each other in like quest lines how do you yeah. even where do you get your inspiration for when you're doing stuff like this oh my goodness oh there, there's a there's a good joke meme that i found a while ago it says every good dungeons and dragons game needs these four things colorful dice really neat minis plagiarism and then it just kept going <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so so yeah if i remember a particular scene from a movie or a scene from a video game or whatever i think that needs to be in my dungeon like like i think of the trash compactor from star wars episode four that is just such a cool thing like you're trapped um in 60 seconds you're going to be flat as a pancake you yeah. know flat stanley figure it out you know what i mean yeah. like that is to me way more cool than oh okay do you see the trap perception check you don't see the trap okay do you take damage does it dexterity yeah. roll yeah. like to, to me the like getting to see those getting to see the players choose how they want to tackle the situation either with traps or npcs that could either be their friends or their enemies depending on what they want to go for i i, I love seeing the the playground in motion if that makes sense yeah how do you think, because we talked a lot about, you know, the differences between like a good and a bad DM, and, and it seems like it would be really tempting to create this giant plan, and then if it doesn't go to plan, you're suddenly like trying to f maybe force your people, like it seems tempting to want to like make them do a certain thing because oh, yeah. you crafted this thing. How did you fight against that? And I mean, what? how did you implement some of the things we well, talked about in the last episode? Like, well, okay, luckily for me, I knew going in, there's no way they would get to everything. I knew that. And also, just because I've made it and they, this group didn't get to go through that particular area, or maybe they made a choice that, that I thought, eh, that was kind of a, a cop out or whatever, whatever the case, I get to keep that. I still have this mega dungeon. I could run this next year. I'm not running it this semester, for example, but I could easily, you know what? I want to see what another group does when they're met with these same or similar challenges. So I don't have to course outcomes because i myself i'm curious about the outcomes i've left open room for it and i can reuse content if need be hey, that's actually super smart is there is there a market for campaigns like could you monetize this and like oh 100 yeah the official <laughs> companies that produce this stuff so wizards of the coast is the most famous one they were in a lot of hot water exactly a year ago i'm sure the viewers are or the listeners are familiar uh, they produce these campaigns and yeah, the, there's a market for them. There is, I would say, in my opinion, I think the third party, as in Rob Bengal writing his mega dungeon and then publishing it, I think that gets a lot more traction these days than the official material. Um, uh, but yeah, especially if you go to somewhere like it's called the DMs Guild Online. It doesn't look any special, but realistically, it's made by a bunch of nerds who aren't in marketing. Yeah. So it, it doesn't look like a special website, but really good stuff down there. Highly recommend, for example, Duero Deep. That's another mega dungeon that came out some time ago. Yeah, you can, you can find a lot of really cool campaigns and campaign ideas over there. Dang, that'd be wild if I, you became like a famous dungeon dungeon master for that <laughs> that would be something yeah <laughs> for, I like creating this mega dungeon that gets used by dozens of dms like around the country i mean that'd be super cool yeah i i don't know if i'm going to publish it honestly and the reason why is because it would take a little bit of extra effort to get this thing published mm -hmm. whereas i got enough going on at the moment so i yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm content with just having my own little dungeon so yeah you know i guess that's the beauty of it have you guys ever thought about uh maybe recording sessions because there's those um, Dungeons and Dragons is a very interactive kind of game, and so you could have people. It's fun to watch people play, you know, to kind of like do this whole story. Have you guys ever thought about doing something like that? You know, okay. The one of my players in particular, he is a voice actor. Like that's his hobby, and he podcasted his own campaign once. And he, I don't, I don't remember if he offered to do that with the camp, the mega dungeon that we were running or not. But I could bring it up with him because we're still playing D and D. I'm just not the DM this time. Um, my worry there would be that, well, 
how many people know Rob? You know, I don't have a huge TikTok following or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, so. so it kind of started in that square one, but you exactly, know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you could get on somebody else's. Like you can reach out to some people. Maybe you can have someone. One of the, uh, imagine like one of the most famous Dungeons and Dragons playthroughs playing your mega dungeon, and then you oh, get to watch yeah. them. You know what I mean? I feel like that's like another uh, you know motivation for putting it out there. Do you ever feel that you're missing out a little bit on the game because you're DMing so often that you don't necessarily get to like play other people's dungeons, or is that kind of a role that you've accepted that you have? Man, you 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 put this into such a pointed question. Holy cow! <laughs> I I think I enjoy being the dungeon master so much because of that element I explained earlier, where I get to present an obstacle and watch what the players do, and at least a third of the time, maybe even half the time they totally surprised me and like that is really smart and I really hope they win because of that. <laughs> yeah, like yeah. winning being they kill the bad guy, yeah, they steal the loot, right. whatever. I, I just absolutely love that. It's like watching a film. Like even though you're pretty darn sure the be the good guys are going to win, you, like in some of them, they do a really good job of making you like, oh, I hope this works. It's so cool. You know, Indiana Jones, he's got this bag of sand. He's going to replace the golden idol, right? Like that's, those <laughs> yeah. are so cool scenes because we're literally, is he going to do it? I want this to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like that, that's kind of re rewarding, I'd imagine, more so than, not maybe more so, but probably just as much as playing. And um, in a way, you kind of are playing because you'd probably have to play test your own stuff and, oh i don't have time for that jesus <laughs> oh so you just like take it raw you just like <laughs> i don't know anyone okay well i say that some people do play test i okay here's my controversial D, &D opinion yeah. i think balancing is a farce all right <laughs> really dude okay okay the idea that you are going to have the time as a dm to be able to crunch <laughs> the likelihood of success or failure in a game that is about binary you hit or you don't hit damage that's not feasible, okay? That, it, it totally shows. And what balancing really means, and this is where I'm going to really catch a lot of flack, what balancing really means is that the Dungeon Master is going to see when the players are in trouble and magically all the, the monsters are going to miss. Yeah. <laughs> and if the players are winning and stomping the NPCs, magically they're going to start, there's reinforcements that come out or not. Yeah. Is that <laughs> that's not fun is to that, me. That's not something that you I, do. I'm way more interested. Like, you know what, guys? I made these monsters. I thought they'd be cool. I, I happen to know a bit about 5th edition and how some of the math works, so I can gauge a little bit how difficult something might be, but I never know for sure. Case in point, every single boss that the group that was going through the Mega Dungeon went through, I told them straight up, I said, hey, I'm not balancing these encounters. You might have to run. Yeah, yeah. And they just... Most of the bosses, they absolutely curb stomped. And that was so awesome for them, too, because it was like, they won. They got <laughs> yeah. to have that awesome victory. Now, if that kept happening, it would be a little bit... Like, maybe easier. Exactly, right. Yeah. Um, like, like, I'm trying to think of, like, a, like, like, Superman, like, really old Superman. Like, he can bounce hydrogen bombs. It's like, okay, that's not fun anymore. Yeah. But, but, yeah, when the stakes are really on the table... That is where the fun is. And I only, I say only, I only like the game as a player when I'm in those I could die situations. Yeah. I love the stakes, right? A good movie has great stakes. A great book has great stakes. And so I try to replicate that in the game. Yeah, do you, what kind of a reception did you get from the people who play it? Were they like, did it, did it feel good? I mean, I guess not to like boast upon yourself, but did it feel good to like, see the interactions play out, what kind of responses did you get from the Mega Dungeon? Oh! Well, I gotta say, yeah, the triumphal victories were really fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, what else? I, I think at this point, I have been with this group for about a year now. We gel really well together, and so that has been really great. There was, there is a point where we disagree on, uh, on like, like DM philosophy a little <laughs> bit, if you will. Uh, I have a little joke. You know, you know the old joke, like if you go into a room of 10 Republicans, you get 11 opinions. It's the same way with Dungeon Masters. If you go into a room of 10 Dungeon Masters, you get 11 opinions of like, oh, I think I would balance this. I would think I would oh, add a bonus yeah, action see, here. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, we're, we're super opinionated uh, and we love to share it with everybody. So, so yeah, there, there are things that they tell me, you know what? That was a little bit much, and I kind of I agree with them a lot of the time. But sometimes it's just like, hey, that's just my style. I'm I'm yeah. different. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I guess you know, I'd imagine there's not like a super bad way of doing the things because 
um, it's always going to be up to interpretation of what people are doing. And uh, again, you're like a human, you know, you're a human writing things down and creating these ideas. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to kind of talk about the creative process um, more so than just the most important aspect, which is just plagiarism. Uh, when, you're, when you're doing, when you're writing these things, if you were to talk to somebody who's trying to make a DM, what are some examples of dungeons maybe that you did in this, in this mega um, in, in this mega dungeon like what are some of the bosses like what are some of these creative ideas that maybe you think people who oh. are trying to create things they'd like to hear about you know what I mean so maybe what are some of like the, the three most interesting of the 16 dun levels that you had yeah let me think it has been a while since I've visited my document that has all this information which mm -hmm. if it gets corrupted I'm screwed <laughs> what's a good example that was really fun oh yeah there is a portal to a spaceship in the mega dungeon and if you go there you can go into cryo sleep you can bring a like dead space uh uh virus to earth you can grab the laser guns and keep them you could oh, yeah yeah like like i i i said no hold no uh what do they call that no hold no bars hold whatever you know yeah, what i yeah. mean no restrictions like Oh yeah, and it it was so fun to just instead of having to how to put it like like uh, a lot of the books for D and D kind of make it seem like you have to stay in this little box where things are by the rules. It's like what the heck, you know? Yeah. Movies aren't by the rules a lot of the time, right? I thought it would be so cool to go into a cryo sleep chamber, right? Like or or you have to fight a like a living dungeon organism like by attacking the heart when the valves are open, the heart valves are open, and then when they close, it's immune, and so you have to like pace your attacks mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Well, and so with the, with the cryo sleep, what, let's say you chose to do that, would that be something that like affects all of the other dungeons? Like now all the dungeons are like 100 years older. Like is that how you played with the things, or was it like, I guess, what was the, what was the end product of the decisions that they were making? Yeah. Oh, they didn't encounter this. The the particular group I oh. had. <laughs> what they did find, though, is that there was a painting of a gingerbread castle that was actually a dungeon, and you just walk through the painting, and they figured that out, <laughs> and that was pretty fun. Um, it, it turns out too, I could use that dungeon as like a good uh, Christmas one shot. A one shot yeah. is like a <laughs> temporary game, yeah. and uh, sorry, you asked about the cryo sleep. Well, how to put it? How to put it again? The, a lot of the rules of fifth edition make it sound like you have to have every like corner of the rules sorted out, or else you know hell will break loose. And it, so cryo sleep, what does it do? Well, you everybody knows what that does, right? Mm -hmm. You get to sleep in a much shorter time period, like then then is I, I, I'm 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 fumbling my words here, but <laughs> no no problem, man. Uh, you can you can achieve the benefits of sleep, which in the game gets you like your health back and stuff like that. Or yeah, you could go 100 years in the future. Now, had I written out what that would look like? No. Yeah. Because it didn't happen yet, right? Uh huh. Um, yeah. So I, I would say, yeah, if you're if you're a new DM, don't necessarily worry about like, oh, what if they do this? What if they do that? What if they do that? Some you do need to have some corner case things. Like if you present the big bad villain, what if the party just kills the villain before the story's even started? That's possible. Mm -hmm. You could do a few things there, like oh, maybe they see the hologram of the villain or the ghost of the villain. Yeah. Or the villain is something like an earthquake where you actually can't fight it. Fight it and do something about it. Yeah. Until you do, do the quest. Okay, so yep. with the with the gingerbread painting, how do you like I maybe I'll have you DM for me for like a minute <laughs> just to like just to get get in the mood. So like walk me through how you subtly mention that there is a gingerbread painting without making it seem as if this is like a really important aspect. So like, can oh, you DM is. me like two minutes or like a minute, you know what I mean? To like, and subtly bring in this gingerbread painting. Sure. So to set the scene, you are at least two layers deep into this dungeon. You're surrounded by tubes that you know are ready with poison darts, just ready to be loosed at you. You're carefully treading the ground, avoiding all these different pressure plates. It's dark and you can only see the orange light of the walls by your own torchlight. And you come into a massive room where the only thing of note is that there's a huge, easily 20 foot tall painting of a gingerbread house. There are also two exits to the room. What do you do? <laughs> okay, okay. And so it's like, it is kind of like the center focal point, but I guess it's not obvious. I was thinking that like, you walk into this library, there's 
dozens of bookshelves around each with different colors and like you list off the names of a few books oh and that you would... say like the candle and and then like um, amidst 40 <laughs> details of this room you say and there's also a gingerbread painting <laughs> you know what i mean oh right right to, right like, that figure out that's a that's a dm style thing i prefer to i prefer to have my traps for example out in the open I like to just skip the whole, did they see it? I want to tell them there is a trap and turn it into like a puzzle, right? Because mm -hmm. just because I tell you there's a 20-foot spiked pit, that does not mean, oh, the player solved it. Well, no, if you want to get to the other side, what are you going to do? You know, you know, like get against the wall and really try and... Shimmy what, or, Exactly, yeah. yeah. Or are you going to try and leap across? 20 feet's a long time. Or are you going to find like a long board? I love that part of the game. And so sometimes, like, it, for example, when I told you about this painting, it's not obvious why I told you about the painting, except that, yes, it's clearly important. Whatever you tell the players generally will get, like, interacted with. It, it's mm -hmm. like um, when you're looking at a, uh, when you're in a video game and something like shimmers, it's like, oh, I can, inter I can press A on that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So... It there's yeah. a warning for that too. I got to tell you, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times, you know, you describe a room and if you describe it like this, there's a great oak door before the office of the magistrate. What do you do? You described the door, right? So they're like, okay, I'm going to shoot the door. <laughs> Nothing happens. And then they're really, oh, okay. Whoa. Hang on a second. I'm going to cast telepathy on the door. I'm and you, you will, you will obliterate that door because you, as the DM, said this is what's important. Uh -huh. The same thing happens in movies. If in movies, they show you a character, they really show you inter him interacting, like especially like a taxi cab driver, and that character never comes up again. It's like, oh wait, but we were told that this was an important yeah, character. Yeah. yeah. So you do gotta watch out when you describe things because <laughs> what you describe is what gets interacted with. Oh, or, okay. or the players note it and then move on if it didn't seem that interesting to them. Okay, and so like with the door, it would have been funny if they obliterated the door, but the task was just to open it, like a normal door. You know, oh, precisely, like, yeah, turn yeah. The, turn the knob, yeah. Whereas really what I could have said is you make your way to the magistrate's office and inside, because really the door, who cares if they open a, it? Yeah, court. <laughs> okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, but like, you, easy you, mistake. You never find it like kind of necessary to put in like, you know, red herrings or something that's just like... Oh, I do. Okay, okay. But, yeah. well... You don't want to, like, a... overcrowd it, like, and make all... Because I guess maybe what I'm interpreting what you're saying as is it's not that you're having them find the puzzle. You just want them to solve the puzzle. You know what I mean? Like, part of the puzzle isn't finding that there is a puzzle. You know what I mean? Like, you're kind of just open about it. Yeah, it, it'll, it'll depend. Because, again, back to this, this painting example, by, by my mentioning the painting, I do not at all indicate how you solve it or what it's for. It literally could just be dressing. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of that in the dungeon. I think my DM style maybe gives it away. Maybe I don't use enough red herrings. But then again, I want to be able to run this in a way that I can look at my notes and say, here are three things about this room you need to know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe one of them's a red herring. Like, I'm trying to think of one. I don't I, I don't do those very often because like <laughs> yeah. if I say like there's there's blood on the bookshelf, that's important. Yeah. That is not a you know, and especially if I mention that, you know, they're gonna go over there, I'm and gonna like, cast detect like evil presence or whatever. Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Do you think that there's any objectiveness when it comes to running like a good D and D campaign? Like are there things that you can say like it's pretty much always bad if you do this, or it's like pretty much always good if you do this? It, you know what I'm saying? Ooh, like, good do, question. Do you think there's like a style in so, like, when you choose not to do red herrings, is that just because it's not your style, or is that because you think, like, there's some objective, like, truth that you probably should I think it fits me. I hesitate to say that one's objective. One thing I can say, I think, with certainty, this isn't very common, but if the DM is antagonizing, or sorry, antagonistic towards the players, as in, I really hate that you did that, Bob, now I'm going to kill your character. Like, some DMs will do that. They won't say that out loud, but they will literally, you know what? A green dragon appears in fire breath, you're dead, or yeah. whatever. And I can kind of understand it because sometimes, you know, you, you're like, oh man, I really spent two hours making this, uh, what's it called? This story or this quest of this dungeon, and you ruined it. Um, that can happen if you, if you have like a really narrow focus. It's not terribly common. Yeah, I've seen people talk about stuff like that. Like people will do like, this is what a good DM does, or, and this is what a bad DM does. And I've, I've always wondered if, if you had, if you kind of look at that research and 
Or look at the Gulf War say research. We uh, were yeah. staring at fifty <laughs> nerds yeah. playing D and D. Yeah, we we surveyed a hundred nerds, and they said that this was the number one right. <laughs> number one red flag for DMs. Yeah, <laughs> right. I was wondering if if you had any advice, like if if someone's making a dungeon, like if you had like the top do and don't. Oh, of, like, the top do and you know, don't dungeon, of the dungeon? dungeon. Yeah, like if you were to. Talk to somebody who wants to create a dungeon or get into dungeons. And oh, yeah. What are, yeah, what are, yeah. What's like your biggest advice and biggest, like, don't do this? Do not have empty rooms because those are boring. <laughs> okay. It either has a clue, a monster, a trap, something. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to be balanced. Yeah. <laughs> That's, okay. Yeah. There, see, I told you, it's like you go into a room of, of 10 DMs, you get 11 opinions. Yeah, so, uh, so most of that is. My opinion, honestly, just I think there should not be empty rooms. But you can have empty rooms and still have a good game. That style, learning tips and tricks and whatnot. So I didn't quite answer your question there. But I still would recommend no empty Avoiding rooms. Empty rooms yeah. yeah, that really helped me run it too. Because then I only have, if it's particularly packed dungeon, nine rooms. Right? There's nine interesting things to be interacted with. Well. Yeah. Nine places, at least, where that is. Instead of, well, I've got a bunch of filler rooms, and because uh, that's a lot to keep track of, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to think because I remember when I was little, I was always trying to create like Dungeons and Dragons style games. Or no like, way. I would. I would. Oh man. So I tried to. I think my biggest one was I collected Pokemon cards for the purpose of making a Pokemon RPG with the cards. And so I wanted to like lay out like towns and stuff interacting with and I, I never and I also did that with Legos as well. I would create like Lego characters and like I'd have a whole system of like you can shoot 11 blocks and you have like this percent chance of missing. You know what I mean? But it never oh my like, goodness. it would never progress into like something that was actually playable. Like it was always just funny to like nerd around and like create. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. As a lot of I, I would you believe I did like basically the exact same thing. I had like <laughs> mega block halo characters and yes. I tried to invent a game around it. Those were so sick. Yeah. Because you'd have like the the. um what are they called? The Banshees and the you have all the like Lego, the Lego vehicles yeah. running around the Warthogs and stuff. <laughs> I, mean, so, I was I would do the exact same thing. And yeah, I, I guess that's what D and D can be. I have I found I really enjoy painting the miniatures. Um, now it's not all about the tactical combat because controversial DM opinion. You don't need a lot of that. Uh, you can you can have a lot of fun with the game without necessarily having. Okay, this is five feet away. Like when you're watching Lord yeah. of the Rings, it's not like, oh man, is Legolas gonna run out of arrows? That's not a concern, right? right. Or like, he might have he might have critically failed into it. If there's gonna be a crit or a crit fail, yeah, you, you get the picture. Yeah, well, and so I guess, do you think maybe that your focus is more on the story aspect as opposed to like the gameplay aspect? Because I know some people who are really interested in like playing a strategic game, kind of like. Um, like super mechs or whatever you know what i mean like they're interested in playing a game that's like very percentage based like they're doing all these calcs versus people who are more like i want to convey like a story i want to convey a mission i want to convey feelings. yeah do you think I, that's a distinction that you have or absolutely uh, yeah like a couple of the players in my play group are definitely in that like mech category i don't think there's anything wrong with that it's just a different style and that means as a dm i know what can interest them mm -hmm. if i give a magic item that does an extra five points of damage but only if you're speeding you know like if you're like dashing at a at a full sprint those kind of things are really exciting because it's like oh new tactical yeah. advantage right <laughs> yeah. in addition to just being a cool magic item uh -huh. um yeah that's just a player to player thing if your player has invested a full 24 hours in making their character and what they're going to choose at every level up to level 10, you know you've met one of those players. Yeah, like as optimally yeah. as possible, as in like I need to make Bingo. sure that I'm dealing the I, max amount of damage. I, I'm definitely very weird in my group for that because I, I like show up to the game and it's not that I'm callous about it. I'm just like, you know what? I feel like playing a character with low constitution, which means I have like zero health. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be fun. And everybody's like, what? Because <laughs> yeah. you would never do that. Uh -huh. And yeah, I just, okay, I'm playing a sailor. That's what he does. And he, in combat, you know, this is the die I roll or yeah. whatever. But 
<laughs> yes, a just wet noodle fight on the battlefield, but he's like really good at <laughs> stealth or something. Yeah, well, specific. yeah, I I don't care what Tom Cruise's hit points are. You yeah. know, can he <laughs> yeah. do the cool thing or not? Yeah. Like I'm I'm there for like the interesting. Can I think of this, that, or the mm -hmm. other? Um, the dice are hardly necessary in that way. Yeah, um, I think. Yeah, I think some people are just really interested in, in in playing like a strategic game. Like I know my brother is much more interested in like the strategic war aspect of like positioning. Like in games like, I feel like it's the difference between playing like XCOM versus playing like Uncharted or something. You know what I mean? It's kind of like here's the simple like what's gonna happen to you versus like calculated plays of like team dynamics and stuff. One hundred percent. Hey, D and D was born out of war gamers, folks who took you know miniature war models like okay i move my guys over here and they have this percent chance of mm -hmm. dealing damage or causing uh casualties and stuff like that so it, it's it's ingrained into the hobby the yeah. guild was actually called originally the guild of war gamers and role players uh, okay before before i had arrived to isu way long ago but oh, okay so then it's more like a strategy based as opposed to like some of your more casual i guess not like monopoly but like <laughs> you know more casual like uh, wingspan, you know, like yeah, uh, uh, more, more all encompassing as opposed to just like Stratego or <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, let me tell you, I have recently become like addicted to this board game Diplomacy. It's at the same time fun and also like highly competitive. You you do have to be like some kind of a scumbag. Is this a to... lying like a uh, deception? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's what it is. There are seven powers in Europe in the spring of 1901 and. Twice per year, you get to dictate what your units are going to do. And it's very simple. If it's one versus one, they can't overpower each other. But if you have support, you just count who has the most, and then that unit gets to dictate where you move. But you get to talk about it. <laughs> okay. Seven people being like, I'm totally your friend. Yeah, I'll support you over here. And well... <laughs> you can imagine what happens. It's That's... like it's like real world, like like uh, Machiavellian politics. It's just hilarious. There's the tactical aspect of like, oh, I'm in the Strait of Bering or wherever. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna maneuver over here, and that way he actually can't get the numbers to overpower me. But there is the the but talking also, side. Like, the, that that sounds so simple, but so fun. There are some games that have cracked the code of like. There are three things you can do, and it seems so uninteresting. And then you play it, and you're like, "Oh, there's actually a ton that I can do." One hundred percent. Yeah, that that's diplomacy for you. So oh, that's really fun. I'm trying. I really like the deception style games because you can play though. It, it doesn't. There's not as high of a barrier of entry for people. You know what I mean? Like Secret Hitler's really good. Um, Avalon's really good because you can just like okay. It's pretty simple. Like it's either the quest is gonna go or it's not gonna go. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> yeah. Like the talking is much simpler. Whereas th that's it seems like a really good combo of okay, here's the strategy of like risk, but then also you can actually team up and you're encouraged to team up. Whereas risk is kind of like yeah, exactly. Uh, I I do find myself the games that I like most involve that player to player interaction. There's a popular one on the market called Ticket to Ride, and it's a multiplayer game. But here's what you do: you're all staring at the board, and you place down your little trains, and occasionally, oh, you took my spot, and that's it. It's not <laughs> yeah. very much interaction, so yeah. I don't enjoy it very much, as opposed to diplomacy, which, hey, can I talk to you for a second? Yeah, I think I'm going to do this, 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 and this. Yes, I love those. Like you were mentioning, what, what was another one you mentioned? Uh, uh, Secret Hitler. Hitler. That one's a great one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Secret Hitler is really fun. Secret Hitler is really fun because you don't know who, who your people are, and there's, like, ways to communicate. Like, sometimes I'll just, when I, <laughs> I just, I'm a... Uh, I'm a liberal and then I'll be like looking at somebody and I'll just be like like trying to convey to them like acting like <laughs> I know that they're oh, Hitler or something that's good. <laughs> just to see if they like look at me and be like I'm oh, going to have to try that it's, it's like a <laughs> one out of ten chance that you just happen to look at Hitler <laughs> because otherwise you look like a super fascist but it's oh, yeah. totally worth making <laughs> making the joke. oh that that sounds amazing it's, it's oh, just yeah. really funny to like look around and try to like ping like be like you know it's like, yeah wink, wink, wink. wink. <laughs> so it's really it's really good stuff um what are the future plans for um what are the future plans for the guild we are not a terribly ambitious group we meet twice a week and well recently because i found diplomacy you can do that online so i recently started an online game and that is going down it is it is <laughs> yeah. very fun i'm like addicted to it i swear 
But in terms of like big, broad things, every semester we have like an event or a tournament. That's pretty fun. Somebody brings in a new game and it's like, oh, wow, this is the new game that we all want to play. Cthulhu Wars was one that um, one of our members, John, brought in. It's Risk, but with Cthulhu miniatures, they all have special abilities and very fun game. I can attest. (laughs) One of my favorites easily. So like kind of the new stuff is... Mostly like new board games that are about to come out. Do you have any new plans for um, D&D? Like, are you creating another? I have run into writer's block, I think, because after that mega dungeon, I am having trouble coming up with new ideas. Granted, I did make like 16 full dungeons. Right. Like, that's a lot of content. Nobody's blaming you for (laughs) for not having everything up your sleeve right now, but... um, 100%. I I love a role-playing game called Blades in the Dark, it's based on like crime in early to late 19th century, like New York or Paris okay. or London. I absolutely love that game. I would love to start a game of that. And I also like pirates. I've run a game of D&D that takes place in a pirate uh, time in history. And that's pretty fun too. Okay, those but, are pretty interesting, very yeah. different styles. <laughs> no no concrete de- details yet, because you do need details, right? Mm-hmm. Like... Oh, this would be fun to X Y Z. Yeah, bingo. I don't have that yet, but uh, yeah. I'm trying to get a grasp on like what are. Like, I asked you about. Um, can you give me more examples of uh, dungeons that you had done, like in your mega dungeon? 100%. Like, I want to hear like what. What are some of the other ideas? Because it's hard to even grasp. Like, there are only so many plot lines I could even think of for a movie, let alone like a playable. Thing. Oh you know yeah. What I mean, so like, walk me through a couple other dungeons that you were doing. Yeah. Well. The this particular game I ran, I run it. There is no like main storyline. I don't say up front, here is the big bad, or that there is even a big bad. Here are the dungeons. There's loot down there, and you want it. Okay, yeah. But it's guarded. Yeah. And there's different factions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'll give you an example. Uh, what's one that I really like? Ah, okay, yeah. There is a like a mechanical set of towers, and the gimmick of this spoiler alert in case I ever publish this is that these towers, every hour, they reorganize the directions of their little platform. So like if the platform looks like like this, it goes south and west, in an hour it's just going to turn to a different spot. So you're completely blocked off in some situations. There is a group of cultists that would like to use a robot in this place to destroy the world, basically. That's what they're trying to do. There are also, who else is there? There's also an undead dragon that wants to, oh no, it's been so long. I can't remember what he was there doing. But there's there's three factions in pretty much every spot and they all have like non, they have goals that are going to intersect. Like I want this for my ends, not yours. The players can come in and say, oh yeah, we'll help you get this robot. Maybe they won't. (laughs) Yeah, maybe they won't. If you can help us destroy this undead dragon so we can take its treasure, and the the cultists will say, absolutely, we don't care about treasure. We just want to destroy the world. Mm -hmm. Or whatever it is. Okay, okay. And so it's kind of like, you're kind of creating multiple little paths and then trying to make them intersect. Okay, so it's kind of more like, you're not as concerned about making this really awesome overarching thing. You're kind of more concerned about like, what are some like really cool, interesting gimmicks that like can combine to make something cool? Okay. Yeah. Okay, and that and that's a pretty interesting style. But um, is there is there anything else about like the future of uh, the guild that you know you could share with share with me or maybe people who? Because at some point you're gonna have to pass you know down a lineage. Oh yeah, you know? a so, lineage. Oh man. <laughs> and that's so this this needs thought. to you know this needs to be a a thing that they can listen to to be like you know. I'm passing down the board game club. You know what I mean? Like, what are some of the goals in mind? Is there any collaborations? Do you guys play Magic there? Yes, we do. Oh, maybe that's one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Starting, I think it was last school year, we started doing Magic on the second Saturday of each month and Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh card games on the first Monday of each month. And especially for the Magic, we get we get a lot of people to show up. I play magic as well, and that's always super fun. So yeah. Yeah. For the most part though, if I had any wish, it's that when I leave, and I know this will be true, I'm pretty darn sure that it will still continue after me. I didn't come here and set this thing up. Apparently the guild was formed in 74 
which also happens to be the year that D&D original that nobody had heard of before was made. Wow. It's 50 years old now. <laughs> Come to think of it, oh my goodness, this fall we're going to have to have a 50th anniversary something. I know uh, it. Dude, yeah, you have, guys absolutely should. I wonder, there has to be, there have to be some conventions or something that you guys could field trip down to. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. D&D or like magic, because I know Mayhem does stuff. I know Magic and Miniatures does Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. So uh, maybe collaborations with them would be cool. Or Yeah, maybe. Something. But for the most part, really what it is, and I've really, really been so blessed here in Ames with this, is that it is the perfect community. You just hang out with people. I was, unfortunately, for Thanksgiving, my family lives in California, and you know I can't afford to go see them every holiday. One of my friends from this club invited me to his family's Thanksgiving. It was an awesome time. You know, just how to put it, how to put it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sound like, like somebody who's, who's 10 years older than I am, you know, oh, kids these days, or not 10 yeah. years, <laughs> like, you know, 30 years, oh, kids these days on your, well, it's, it is really easy, right, to just go home and you're on your computer or on your phone and that's kind of it. But, oh my God, it is just so great to, to sit down and have like this second family, basically with with this club so yeah wow that's i mean <laughs> dang that's really awesome stuff with like club where it takes a lot to get somebody to come to like a family thanksgiving and so that's really cool that you guys are close i'd imagine that because it seems like when you're listing the dates and stuff it seems like you guys meet at least once a week but multiple times a week for yes we do a, a lot of a, a lot of things so it seems like if there's going to be a club that is going to encourage this kind of relationship it's it's going to be this club we meet for four hours up to four hours uh twice a week it's not mandatory people come of their own volition it's like hey we want to play board games and then outside of that at least half of the members also do D D at least once a week okay so yeah that's a that's a pretty tight a big bond. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so you guys spend like it's not necessarily a commitment well okay i do, I, I don't mean to belittle commitments because it is important when you're with your D&D group especially like yeah we're going to commit to this time of the week but no it's it's definitely not a if you're in you're in <laughs> you're, yeah. you don't have to hey guys I can't make it on Mondays we we have great members who can only show up on one of the days love them yeah I mean that's just how it is I guess yeah commitment might be like a a hard word for <laughs> for somebody who uh, has so much fun playing it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. I, I love being there. Yeah. It's, it's such a joy to be there. I mean, why uh, it's board games, right? Yeah. I mean, they were designed to, to have fun. Do you ever feel <laughs> as if, um, maybe the competitive nature might get too much or, uh, that there are any like social issues with, um, we, we usually don't run into them at all. Honestly, like, once a semester, maybe there will be a new member that shows up or maybe somebody's just having a bad day and they'll get particularly agitated that mm. they lost. Yeah. But that is very rare. Okay. So maybe that's just this particular group that we have. Maybe you guys are awesome. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's the president. Yeah. That's what it is. Maybe it's the... well, okay. <laughs> no, it, it was like that before I was the president too. I do have to say though, I, okay. I moved from California, right? Mm -hmm. And at the time I did that because none of the California schools were open. They were all closed for COVID up until some of them 2022 literally throughout the spring of 2022 they were like mm, i don't know there's covid around it came out in 2019 that's why it's called covid 19 yeah. <laughs> and oh my god okay where i grew up in silicon valley when i go there now it's honestly so sad because around here just this week in the first two school days of this week i've run into two people on each day who were like happy to see me right? Not, not even concluding my classes. Like literally I'm walking from one place to another. I don't get that where I'm from in California. I sincerely hope it's just a Silicon Valley thing. I get the feeling it's not, but yeah, that kind of sense of belonging here in Ames, it's too good to be true. So I'm absolutely going to settle down here after I graduate. Um, not necessarily Ames. I can't promise that because you know, I got to get a job, right? Um, and they, they might not be in Ames. Materials engineers are pretty specific. That's my major, by the way. But I absolutely love the Midwest for that, like sense of belonging and hospitality. And where do you think that comes from? Like in the Silicon Valley, what do you think is like? I have, I have, I have a theory. Um, there is terrible traffic there, and so I remember when I was going to one community college, I had to drive for two hours 
And in particular, I did not schedule my day well. So I was doing that in order to attend a 50 minute class. <laughs> Five zero. It was not good. And most people do that. That two hours is the average. Some people do it for three. Is Back four and forth. Four hours total? Or yes. two hours total? Four hours, two hours, two, two hours back every single day. You can say that maybe there's a way to solve this like traffic wise. And maybe there is, maybe there's not. I'm not sure. I haven't looked into that. But the way things are and have been for quite a while is that everybody who lives there is spending four, hour th four hours of their day on average stuck in traffic. I think that has a lot to do with it. Really? Because that, that has to go that. somewhere. Yeah, I've never heard of that being a reason as to why. Like I've heard that. Also, the Republican me wants to say that it's because yeah. they're liberal. <laughs> <but>. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like I like No, like, I don't I've, hate liberals. I've definitely, but. I've definitely heard that more, and I've definitely heard that like it's going to happen when you're in a more populated area. And I also know, or I, I think I know, like in the Silicon Valley, that's like a um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like th that's kind of like a higher value area as far as like people who live there, right? Isn't that like? A lot where a lot of people like stars live there, like people in the Hollywood area. Like, is that around there or Hollywood is in Southern California, quite a ways away. Okay. You can drive to LA from Silicon Valley in about a day. It takes about like eight hours. To oh, get. Okay. A lot of people, what they do is if they make a lot of money and a lot of people do in Silicon Valley is on the weekend, they go down to Disneyland in LA. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. But, oh, okay. So but, I was trying to think of like what population lives in. in, in so yeah, well, well, a lot of companies like Apple, for example, Apple, maybe Netflix is down there as well. I forget. Oh, it, it shows I haven't been there in, in so while, long. Yeah. Uh, but no, a lot of high profile companies live there. It's called Silicon Valley for the uh, Silicon chips. Okay. Yeah. Electronics. Well, you know, and we, we were talking a little bit earlier um, about like, we we're talking a little bit about the way that politics makes you feel like and how you hear or how you talk about these things do you think that that has an effect do you think maybe like political conversation is louder like down there and that's why people are yeah. more upset or do you think that yeah yeah before i continue i do just want to say um my my political opinions and whatnot are separate from the guild so don't take i'm i'm, I'm a uh, I, i'm a republican right but i that has nothing to do with the guild mm -hmm. um but I would say when I was there last, there were some billboards up that that they were they were by this organization called Jew Belong. It was like a Jewish organization, and it said, you know, you know, for a town that cares a lot about social issues, blah 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 blah. And it yeah, it, it does seem like Silicon Valley is one of those places where they you know everybody's really loud on Twitter about like, oh, I care about this, I care mm -hmm. about that. Well, a Jew Belong is a hilarious. <laughs> like, I didn't name it. Like that's a that's apparently Dude, what that's, they're called. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah. okay, and, and so talk to me about this kind of uh, renaissance in in maybe thinking that you because you, you oh I'm not that smart. No, well, I'm 24. Know, I, I can't be called a visionary like that. <laughs> <laughs> visionary. Well, walk me through some of your thought processes and how you've been feeling about like the general political conversation. Because you said that it was something that is difficult to des to describe, but I, I kind of yeah, yeah. I, I find it so difficult to describe. One thing I'm often tempted into is how, how to put it. How to put it. I guess when I was in high school, I realized that oh, there's a way other than the the liberal point of view, like politically speaking, because in Silicon Valley, basically everybody's liberal there. And so I found out, hey, I'm, I'm much more in line with conservative values. And what that led me to is like, okay, I went online and found all the different conservative talkers, you know, like Steven Crowder, people on Fox News, stuff like that. And I, th I still think a lot of them have good points, but the political discourse right now is just everybody yelling at each other, right? Like it, it and at this point, it, it, for the most part, it really doesn't even matter what side of the political aisle you're on. It's just a bunch of like, I hate this person, you should too. And it's like, Hang on a second. Like, I mean, these are important issues. Let's not get that wrong. I'm not trying to be naive about this, but like every other person you meet is of the other political party. Like the clerk who helps you at the grocery store, that could be a Democrat, like, you know, or that could be a Republican. Like what, what are we doing? Right. Why, why is this so important that we feel the need to, to excommunicate everybody in our lives that doesn't have that same political view as we do? So. What do you think the defense of this is? So if you were talking to somebody who didn't agree with you, what do you think they'd say? Like, what do you think people who are defending, like, hatred of the other political party, what do you think they're saying? People who disagree. Oh, with it's a crisis. It. Yeah. We have to. It's a crisis. Can you see what they're doing? Oh, my God. 
Yeah, well, yeah, that's a good impression. <laughs> did you hear what Trump did? Oh yeah, my God! Yeah. You, know. you know, do you ever find, do you ever catch yourself feeling that way uh, about like uh, Democrats in any way? Like, you ever catch yourself? Like, oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, that is that is one of the greater temptations I face is to to buy in and just think, oh my God, I have to hate Democrats. Mm-hmm. Which is just like, excuse me. Now, granted, okay, I don't want to how, how to put this. See, I I really am having trouble describing this because. I even have trouble uh, finding people to discuss this with, right? Because you do have to be so like frank and vulnerable about these subjects, right? Like let, let's make, let's make no mistake, you know, like in the Bible, it says like, in order to be good, you do have to hate evil, right? So there is something out there that you have to hate, right? But to project that onto the people you meet, right? Like in everyday life, it's like, hang on a second, buddy. Like, are people really that evil around you? You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, I think I think an even broader, and I've tried to find like a concise way to explain this, but I think there's a really huge separation between your average person, your average Democrat, and then the people who are kind of like creating the Democrat uh, agenda. Oh, yeah. There's like a yeah. huge difference because when you talk to a Democrat, you like, let's just say that you had like a your view was that in every single facet, Democrats are wrong about every single thing. Right. Um, you have that view and you see a Democrat. I don't think that that Democrat is wrong about every single thing. I think they just kind of got like propaganda. Like someone just told them to feel that way. <laughs> right. You know yeah. I mean? So you can't necessarily like blame the average person for feeling the way that they do about whatever politic. Like you could probably understand that like a Democrat agrees with you on 95% of things, but it's that 5% Maybe. that seems really loud. You know, like we all have like the human fundamentals of like, I want the best for people. I want, but they just think, yeah. you know, they just don't, they don't agree with you on how we should do that. You know what I mean? And yeah, that's so true. That's it's true. not necessarily the fault of like the average person who's a Democrat as to why they think the way they think. Someone paid for them to think that way. You know, that, I mean? like, that is true. I can be guilty of, of that mo- myself. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of money in politics. And this is obviously, I'm using Democrat as an example. This obviously goes both ways. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd say there's, it's, it seems as if there's a lot more money coming from the Democrats, but um, maybe that's, maybe that's, not, they could still be right. But the idea though is yeah. that you can't necessarily blame the average person for feeling the way they yeah, well, do. I guess here's kind of what I'm trying to get at too, is that like in my conversations at the guild, I don't even know if people necessarily know I'm Republican because that just doesn't really come up. It might, right? Like if somebody mentions something, it's like, oh yeah, I agree with this thing. Oh yeah, I, I think Ron DeSantis is a good candidate, for example, mm-hmm. if they wanted to talk about that. But that just doesn't come up. Now, maybe it's the case that we've learned that politi- political discussions are so hostile that it's best to just avoid them, which is a strategy, right? I don't mm-hmm. think it's the best because then you, you know, but you don't, you don't have to come about it like, you know what? I believe this. I'm going to tell you about it. So that way I get, you know, I get yeah. a sense of you, Elijah. I don't know. Can I <laughs> this guy yeah right that just doesn't usually come up and so for it to go from zero to 60 as far as like oh yeah actually i do support ron DeSantis. oh my god you support ron DeSantis? you must be a horrible person or the other way around it's like whoa where did we how did we get there mm-hmm. right like i was first interacting with a human being and all of a sudden we're at defcon you know like <laughs> yeah well i think it's i think it's especially hard because you only hear you you don't hear this criticism coming from the left really like i feel like so i'm an ra um a resident assistant and that is a very liberal group of people oh yeah we're at a, we're in an american college, university yeah and so it's yeah. already a very liberal group of people um and so it's very interesting that it's only really the right that's saying uh why does it become hostile when i say my views where if you say your views it doesn't really become that way you know oh, right, I mean? right, right. Like when a, when a le- person from the left says their views, and it's really weird. I wonder, it seems as if people would blame that on the position. They'd say like, well, of course the right feels that way because they are terrible people. <laughs> but oh, yeah. liberals aren't, you know what I mean? Hey, man, that is uh, some good logic right there. Impeccable. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> well, but it's difficult because when you're coming from the position, people are interpreting everything that you're saying as like, oh, of course he feels this way because he's a terrible person. You know what I mean? So there's right. like something okay. that you have to attack fundamentally first. So if you're going to talk yeah. about like how should this political discourse be, there's something there's something that we have to get at before that, and I feel like it has to stem from something along the lines of like 
we're all people. We want what's best for other people. And what you were saying, like political yeah. conversations don't have to be angry, even if you disagree. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, it starts from this, but... Um, Especially because, as, if I can give a recent example, like the, the war between Hamas and Israel, for example, almost nobody here at this university has any stake in this. Right? Maybe you are a citizen of Israel, or maybe you are with like the Palestinian territories. I forget what they call themselves. Then maybe you're actually like invested into this. But for all the flag waving and like, you know, profile picture like updates, this doesn't actually really affect us that much. And we're, we're students, right? Like most of us are in our like mid 20s. Like this is not something that we have an effect on or that like we can have an effect on. Like thoughts and prayers are good. I'm not going to belie or belittle those, but the idea that we should, this should be our primary identity, our stance on this war. It's like, where did that come from? Right? Like, yeah. And I, I, I do agree with you. I think it, it's such a hard philosophical question because imagine if, imagine if like you were getting mugged and like five people were like, I can't physically overpower this guy. And five people walk by you while you're getting mugged. That feel really terrible oh, to be ignored right. while you're getting mugged because they're like, "Well, it doesn't necessarily concern me." You know what I mean? I see what you it's, mean. It's, it's a difficult thing to tackle because, of course, it's not like your responsibility to do this. But I understand it from the perspective of the people who are like, "These people are in trouble." Whichever side you think is in trouble, you know what I mean? Like, of course, we have to like rise up and and do something about it. And so, yeah. I, I don't think you know. I wonder. I wonder what the position is that can kind of do both sides of this. Like, it's not your job to do this. Bingo. But also, like, it's good if you do. You know what I mean? Like, Well, for, for some people, like, it is their responsibility to address this issue, right? Hey, I actually have some experience in Middle Eastern military affairs, and I care about the subject. Maybe that's a sign that actually your passion should actually go there. But for me, I've never been outside the United States. I'm currently trying to earn my degree. I have no stakes in this war. I, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. this, this is, it's sad. But like most students, right? Like what, what, what can I even do from right over here? Right? Yeah. I, I think in particular, one thing I noticed recently is that we say like, I support this. I support that. It's like, in, in the game diplomacy, for example, if you say, hey, I'm going to support you over here, that means something. I am using my unit. I'm using my resources to help you. That's what support means. Whereas these days, usually that means I, I agree with this person, which is different. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I yeah. think my biggest... Have you, have you heard... I've been talking about this just like a, a little bit more recently. Have you heard of this idea that your opinion on who should be president is eight times more valuable than your vote. Um, oh, I haven't heard that. Well, because it, it feels like, like whoever you vote, that's one vote. But if you can convince eight other people to vote, that's eight votes. You that's know what true. I mean? So your opinion yeah. on it. So there's this idea where people say like, of course an independent's never going to win. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That ideology is so much more valuable than voting for an independent. Because by saying that, by saying that phrase, an independent can never win, oh, yeah. that independent just lost eight votes because eight people heard me say that and they feel it. Right, so you're, sure. you're on this podcast and you're talking about, um, you're talking about like activism and being like, okay, well, it doesn't really like affect us. Yeah. 30 people might hear that and they also no longer want to do something. Okay, well, in that case, I challenge, yeah, for all the folks who have changed their profile pictures, either for the Ukraine war or the, the war that's going on in uh, Israel right now, I'm curious what you have accomplished. Yeah, like you know, it's brutal, but let's just be frank. Like you, you haven't done anything. Yeah, well, that's okay because it's not your responsibility. Yeah, and I wonder, I wonder to like because I don't know. The activism is so hard because I'm so against other people telling me what I should do. Oh, I you know am too. I mean? Yes, yes. <laughs> so that's I'm, why I left California. You know, yeah, so I'm super against that, but I do think there is a lot of power in social media engagement. So I think that changing your profile picture might convince one other person to support your cause. Huh. And if that one other person convinces two other people, you know what I mean? Like it kind of extrapolates 
beyond okay. one profile picture. So I, I would say that I don't I don't necessarily agree with I don't agree with you should do this, but I do agree in its effectiveness. I do think it is effective right. to have okay. a political opinion. I don't think it's effective to be controlled by your political opinion, which I think is what you're talking about. I actually I think, agree with you there. That, you make yeah. a really good distinction. I like I think that's what you're talking about is you say like I don't agree with like how it affects you, but I you know, I would try to say that it is effective to, to be active, like to, for activism. At least maybe this is my college brain speaking. <laughs> maybe maybe, or maybe all the 40-year-olds are listening. And are like, of course, the college student thinks that yeah. activism works. But well, um, I think it's an important distinction. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess what are your thoughts on the way that politics affects people like as a whole? Like, yeah, well, it, uh, like I said, I, I get tempted to get angry over this all the time, to no avail. Yeah, sometimes I, I, I'm sure people can relate to this. Yeah, sometimes I've been alone in my car and just like, oh my God, I can't believe Nancy Pelosi did X, Y, Z. And it's just like, hang on a second. I'm getting worked up with myself over something I have no control over. Like, it's just, it, God has a unique ability. It's pretty hard to replicate. He can be angry and still be good. Human beings don't have that so well. Right. Yeah, it's much harder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Harder. So, so again, I I don't want it, to. It's so weird because being a pacifist, the idea that there is no place for any kind of good anger, right? That is incorrect. But where where to go in that? I actually just don't yeah, know like right now. Yeah, where the line is. After, yeah, where the no line kidding, is. After no kidding. No kidding. I think a good line would be if something affected, something was in effect here in Ames. Right? Like, okay, I hate to bring this up, right? But like the shooting that happened at Cornerstone Church, there are people here in Ames that can do something about that, right? Like, oh, hey, I, you know what I remember in particular too is that a lot of like mental health professionals were able to jump on the folks that had experienced that trauma of like seeing that happen or hearing the gunshots, for example. That is a great example. So that. That is, you wouldn't even call that like political activism. It's not necessarily political in that case, but those folks had the ability and the generosity of heart to really affect how things happened in Ames. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's what really matters. That, that sounds like a Ted talk, you know? <laughs> no, it's, well, it's super true. And I think people need to hear it. Um, there's somebody saying that your, your local and state elections are so much more important than the presidential elections. Like in every single way, like it is almost. I would like, agree with that. Like if you could replace all of your knowledge about who to vote for for president with who to vote for for your governor, every person should do that ever. Like every person would hit that button to like forget everything about the president and know everything about the governor. They would, I, every person. I am really that. guilty of that, but I would totally agree because, granted, I can't really do this for Iowa, both because I'm not an official resident, so I can't vote here. Um, and I really don't know the lay of the land yet, mm -hmm. you know, so I, what do I know about Iowa politics? Yeah. But in somewhere like Silicon Valley, if I chose to live there, it's like, I've lived here for a while. This is affecting me here. I think I can make this change. I'm going to stand for it. Maybe I even get like a rally together and we like have a hoorah, you know, mm -hmm. like, like change this tax or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, because you can actually affect that. Granted, if you're a social media personality, I suppose you can go bigger scale, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, well, I, I'm not so grand, I guess. Yeah, the issue with, and I think this stems into why it's so easy to get angry at politics is because a conversation about your governor is not nearly as interesting as a conversation about the president. That's a good point. You know what I mean? And that's what's so <laughs> difficult about it. And it's the same thing as we talk, kind of talked about this last time too, but um, the political conversations that are centered around negative is so much more interesting. Oh yeah, could you believe what Trump said? Yeah, oh my God. It's so much more valuable than the, the stuff around the positive. And it's the same way a more well-known person is going to get infinitely more clicks than, than a, a person who's not. And that's, yeah. just the, that's just the lay of the land. That's just how yeah, it is. That's just how it is. I gotta say though, one thing that has been awesome is that some of my friends at Cornerstone Church, I'm, at one of, I'm in one of the C groups, they've taught me to like really practice thankfulness. It's a game changer. Because instead of like naturally tending toward, oh, this negative thing really affects me and I really react to it. Because yeah, if you get like, if you get hot water splashed on you, you, you react to that. Whereas if you, if it's just kind of a pleasant scent out today, you don't necessarily think of that. But yeah, like I, I think I mentioned earlier that I've run into at least four people in the last two days, just by circumstance, who are happy to see me. I'm super thankful about that. And that really is just like, wow, 
thank you, God. Like I didn't necessarily even need that, but it's like a gift, you know? Well, yeah, and that just goes back to how famous you are, uh, and how oh, <laughs> and how much people wanted uh, people wanted this episode. Well, well uh, people approaching you on the street, being like, Rob, <laughs> Rob you need to get it back onto the episode too. I, I wouldn't <laughs> say famous. I'm just I do have a lot of friends. And that's um, good. And that's so what I'm be yeah, thankful for. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, I think thankfulness is like the number one cure for sadness. I think there are like opposites. I really think that sadness, thankfulness, is the opposite of sadness. Um, maybe I need to do some <laughs> research on that, but. Just, research, well, that's how it feels, you know. And, uh, yeah, maybe they, maybe that's a challenge. Uh, if if you like, yeah, just really think about like, okay, what can I be thankful for? What are some things that are going well that I can be thankful for? Yeah, and I wonder, I wonder if it, it, in the realm of politics, if there's a way that you can um, kind of balance out and you can find ways like what are the good things that you know democrats are doing you know what i mean like well, yeah you know, I, like to try to like that exercise. yeah to try to like balance that out to be like hey what are the good things that democrats are doing what are the good things that republicans are doing what are the bad things that republicans are doing what are the bad things that the democrats are doing and to just, just just try to balance it out i think every political conversation that i have with any person because i really try to talk to both to both sides as much as I can is oh good on you up, man bring them to the middle that's the big thing is like bring them to the middle the angrier you are it's not gonna enact change oh and yeah so, exactly you know, and so um, both well, sides maybe it does but it won't be a good change yeah <laughs> yeah no, yeah probably, it's very very good distinction yeah um, and so uh, that's what that's what I try to do is you know it's try to bring them to the middle and I think if you can kind of think about the good things that Democrats are doing that might help you feel a little better it might help you get a little less angry. Um, which again isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it likely is. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, what else were you thinking about with? Uh, you, uh, I, we we should talk about this. Your hot take that you. Oh, sent here to it me. comes. Oh, All right, I'm gonna this. lose my audience no, here. <laughs> That's why we save it for the end. Yeah, yeah. no, I I think that feminism is a farce. That's my hot take. What do you mean by that? Well, feminism is supposed to be about like advancing women, and like the well-being thereof, right? The well-being of women. Have they accomplished anything in that regard? Like on the on the map of like X is time, Y is like improvement in the well-being of women. Have they really done anything in the last five years? I don't think so. Five years? Five years, 10 years. Well, obviously we're going to start from the vote. <laughs> the vote? Yeah, being able to vote. Um, 10 years? Yeah, so that, when was that? That was four exactly. years ago. Yeah, so that was a long time ago. I'm trying to think. Um, Think about it. Are so, there less sexual scandals where women are the victims? No. You know, <laughs> oh man, this is a weird, this is, a, this is an interesting framing. Have I we guess, gotten any closer to solving the wage gap? I don't think it exists, but the folks who think it exists talk about it as though nothing has changed. So it uh, doesn't look like that front's improved. So I'm just very cynical about it. Um, and honestly, I just, you can tell I'm smiling, right? I, I, yeah. I, I, well, I think okay. it's just funny to I me. I guess think about, think about the problems that they're, in the last five years, I guarantee you there are, I guarantee you probably like 10 years ago, like the women and gender studies did not exist as like a degree. I bet you that um, the clubs on campus that are like women focused, like the women in engineering and stuff, I bet you that didn't exist. And you can argue though that that's not necessarily like a, a really notable change because it's more of like a, a feeling of inclusivity. Um, but I'd imagine to women that that's kind of important. It's better than nothing. Um, I'd also imagine that the amount of people who are aware of like what the pink tax is, is tripled in the last like 10 years. I'd imagine that. Oh, more. see, it's even gotten worse. Yeah. <laughs> You're helping me. <laughs> no, no. I mean, like they are aware of what it is. You know what I mean? Like the more oh, people I, who I are aware of women is. issues, um, the pink tax is uh, like an overcharging of women's products that are specifically tailored to women. Um, Oh, how expensive so like is. shampoos or something. yeah, like how expensive right. it is to get like pads and 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 stuff like that. Oh, okay. Uh, like women, women. I admit products. I don't know anything on the subject. So. Well, I, but I, I guess I wonder. Like it depends on it depends on what your view is. If your view is that there wasn't really any issue for women to solve, and then you say that like nothing's happened in the past five years, of course you're going to be right on that. You know what I mean? So like, if your oh. view is that like women didn't really have any issues in the past, that's five a good years, point. Of course, of course, you don't think that <laughs> like feminism accomplished anything. Wow. Because, okay, you really made me think there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because of, like, if your view is that there were no issues, of course. But that's a good point. If you were to ask a feminist ten years ago, 
and you were to tell them all of the things about feminism now, they would probably say like, oh yeah, a lot of, a lot of good things have happened. But okay. I actually want to meet, I actually well want to find out. <laughs> I'd imagine you might not, because I'm not super well-versed in feminism. Um, cause I thought you were going to talk about like, here are the ideas and why I disagree with them. But on a general level, I'd imagine feminists feel pretty successful in the, in the past 10 years in activism. I, I guess so. I don't know. Knowledge, but, um, if you wanted to talk about some of the oh. crazy ideas that they have, <laughs> that's, crazy ideas. that's a more, oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. More applicable like, conversation, but. Uh, yeah, well, unfortunately, I'm not terribly well versed in that, so I wouldn't be the best person to have a conversation. Uh -huh. I I know very little actually about like like how to put it ideological doctrines. Mm -hmm. I absorb what the 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 hoi polloi absorb, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> what is, and I don't say what that is as hoi polloi. I oh, you know, oh, that's a usually it's a derogatory term to refer to you know just the common people like that sheep like basically yeah oh, i'm using that that's yeah no funny but usually <laughs> usually term. usually it's what like for example in silicon valley you know telling other people what to do oh you know the hoi polloi shouldn't need like guns for example that's just an okay. example okay. um they usually people don't actually say that because it's used as a uh what like do you call insult, that like a it, it's usually how to how to i don't even know how to put it it is usually when somebody uses the word hoi polloi, it's in reference to, ha ha, this person thinks they're above the common people. Oh, okay. Yes, that's okay. usually when it's used. Oh yeah, you won't hear a spokesperson say, I think the hoi polloi this. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be really funny. No, that would be That'd really be weird, funny. you know, like these schmucks over here, I, I represent them, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, and I do agree on, on the feminism point. I Like, I do agree that the much louder version of feminism is super cringe and also doesn't really oh like doesn't really like okay yeah that no like i i agree that there's like a super <laughs> extreme like loud voice that's like you guys are terrible um because it seems it seems like the much louder voices tear down men as opposed to bring up women that just seems like the purpose. oh and they tear down women too i mean like women's that's sports probably, are just yeah, dying yeah, right and now and that's so. and that's probably true too i think so I like I agree with you on like the general basis, but I wouldn't try I wouldn't try to say like on a uh, on an oh. effectiveness basis that there's like okay I, well you, I don't know you, well. to to be fair that probably just means you're more educated on the topic because like I said I really oh, I've only got a surface value I just answered your question as far as like hot takes on yeah this yeah right and now. I think I think I, yeah, I think it's I think it's yeah. valuable I didn't want to like dismiss it as like yeah sure you know <laughs> like my, I think it's a valuable take yeah my it, specialty but. is in being the you know part of the board game club that's yeah. that's what my, <laughs> no, my doctorate is in yeah well and i think i think what's i think the most valuable thing that you can have in getting into politics is understanding because you've been very humble about your understanding of it you've also been very humble about the way that it affects you saying that like you also come um you also get affected by politics and sometimes you'll catch yourself getting angry um so i think i think you have the probably the most valuable political take of all time which is oh wow, wow. which is like a general uh, not generally centralist but like a need to improve on your own political understanding a need to improve on your own political reaction and i think it, there's nothing more valuable well hey give yourself some credit there elijah because again i i really have trouble even sorting this out in my own head so literally you're helping me bring this like Good. literally that, that, bring this uh, hopefully that's my purpose into, into me like literally so yeah thank so, yeah. you and that way you've definitely had a successful podcast with at least one listener that's that's <laughs> good. for sure oh good dude well um rob it was awesome having you on for a second time and likewise there, elijah there, there, will, there will likely be more but if is there anything that you would like to say to the audience as kind of a final uh, send off whether it be um, if you want to reinstate some of the times that you guys meet for board game clubs. And That's maybe what like I was going game. to say. Yeah. So politics aside, because usually we don't deal with that at all at the guild. We're a very casual group. We meet in, in spring of 24, we meet in Carver room 305 on Mondays at 6 PM and Carver 205 on Saturdays at 12 PM Bring your board games. If you don't have any board games, there are more board games than there are people. So I guarantee we will, we will, you will meet a friendly person to teach you one of those games. Yeah. Yeah. And Rob, do you have anything else to say about like, um, just a final message, whether it be about, you know, D and D having fun, life, whatever. Do you have any final messages that you want oh, to God. say? Oh God. Well, yeah, I should, I should write a book, shouldn't yeah. I? At age 24, <laughs> I should go, you know, Robert Bengel. A life yeah <laughs> no so i i can't i can't be held to that kind of uh 
guru level. <laughs> hey, and that's a wonderful thing to accept. <laughs> well, it was awesome having you on, man. Likewise. Thank you again. Thank you.